Thank you all for coming. Hello and welcome um, to the Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival for 2021. It's great to be here in person, <laughs> but of course a big fat hello to everyone on Zoom, especially those joining us from your local library or from home, courtesy of your local library. First and most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Iroa Nation who are the traditional owners of this land. We pay our respects to all Gadigal people, especially their elders past and present. I'm Karina Kilmore, a finance journalist, a non-fiction author and a debut crime writer. I'm also on the board of the Australian Crime Writers Association and on the programming committee for Sisters in Crime Australia. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Dixon Room today for this discussion with three other debut writers. Ruth MacGyver. Take a bow, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Hickey. And Michael Burge. Thank you. First, we need to do some housekeeping. Um, our COVID protocols mean we are all double vaxxed and have checked in with QR codes. However, please keep your masks on during the session, um, except for our speakers while we're on stage. Please also mute your phones and no recording. Photos are fine, but make sure your flash is turned off. And if you're posting on your socials, we'd love it if you use the tag Bad Crime Sydney. The plan is to chat for about 40 minutes and then uh, we'll have 10 or 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, for the Zoom audience, if you'd like to send your questions in um, to the chat section, uh, we'll be able to read those out too. Okay, let me introduce you. Ruth Mary MacGyver. <laughs> Ruth is a Dublin-born writer based in Melbourne. She completed a PhD at Curtin University in the area of true crime-inspired fiction. Uh, this helped inform her debut novel, I Shot the Devil. I Shot the Devil won the Rochelle Prize and the Affirm Press Mentorship Award in 2018. In the same year, another one of Ruth's unpublished manuscripts, Nothing Gold, was runner-up in the inaugural Banjo Awards. Ruth likes music, podcasts, cats, drinking, drinking too much coffee, that is, <laughs> bonding with other people's dogs, <laughs> and pining for the Indian Ocean. Michael Burge. Michael is a journalist and author who lives at Deepwater in the New England region of New South Wales. His debut novel, Tankwater, is a coming-of-age crime thriller set in the bush. Michael has also written a non-fiction book, Questionable Deeds, Making a Stand for Equal Love, which helped lift the lid on institutionalised homophobia during Australia's marriage equality campaign. After graduating from the National Institute of Dramatic Art, he did media studies in the UK. Michael's journalism covers issues of equality, LGBTIQA+, popular culture and politics. He's also the director of the annual High Country Writers' Festival. Margaret Hickey. <laughs> Margaret is a teacher, author and playwright from North East Victoria. She has published a collection of award-winning short stories titled Rural Dreams, but her debut crime novel is Cutter's End. Margaret's stories have been published in literary journals and her plays have been performed all over Australia and read in New York. Margaret has a PhD in creative writing focused on landscape in Australian literature. Her thesis was nominated for the Nancy Millis Award for Excellence in Thesis Writing and she is currently working on a second crime novel and as always is deeply interested in rural lives and communities. Wow, debut writers, <laughs> such a special time. Congratulations to all of you. Um, first, I'd like to open the discussion today um, not talking about your writing, but talking a little bit about yourselves. 
um, about your upbringing maybe, your identification, your careers, your people, what's important to you. Um, Margaret, you go first. Thank you. Uh, so I suppose what, what's in interesting about me or what I often think of about my work is that, or whether it might not be interesting, I'll let you judge that, <laughs> but um, is that I'm a product of rural education. So my dad and was a headmaster of little bush schools growing up. So uh, I um, have always lived in the country and, and been, to, I think I went to six different primary schools and they were all with the, the maximum amount of people. The really big school, the massive school was 38 um, kids. Uh, that was at Dean's Marsh out the back of Lawn. But um, so we traveled around a lot as a, as a child. So um, Northeast Victoria or Patchewolik in the Mallee um, Dean's Marsh and later on in rural areas and always as a product of rural upbringing I'm, I'm really interested in that and I still live in a rural town in Beechworth but I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in how rural lives and rural communities and rural people are depicted in um, film, television and in books so it's something um, I feel really strongly about and sometimes I, I can get a bit cross about when I see um, how rural people are depicted but I hope um, you know, in my crime, in my novels and all my writing, that it comes across as authentically as possible. Also, I suppose for Cutter's End, um, I spent a lot of my early 20s and late, um, in the late, uh, late 80s and early 90s hitchhiking, hitchhiking around Australia and up and down the Stuart Highway and working in small pubs and doing things now that, um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of horrified now, but, um, but all that, came to an end um, with Ivor Milat and, oh. and, and that kind of end of innocence. And I suppose that's where my books have led up to rural lives and rural communities. And then um, with this latest book, that kind of end of innocence. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's about it. Thank yeah. you. Michael. Well, I'm very similar to Mark. I was born in the country and uh, grew up there until my parents' marriage disintegrated and I ended up growing up in the Blue Mountains and going to uni here in Sydney and travelling the world, working overseas. But um, as I put tank water together, I kind of entered a life imitates art, imitates life process. So I was writing about a young journalist who goes back to his country town after 20 years away. I'd been away from the region that, that I grew up in for a lot longer than that. Um, and uh, I think moving back to the setting of the book, uh, which is fictitious, but it's based on where I'm from, the New England region of northern New South Wales. Just being there just sort of really brought the story up. And I realised, speaking about the book in the last few weeks, that I actually started writing it when I was 17. Mm -hmm. I was um, just finishing, or starting, finishing my study for the HSC, but about to start doing the exams. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to start writing a book. My English teacher, <laughs> my fabulous English teacher, Yvonne Smith, said, you've got a book in you. And I I must have taken it seriously, uh, but then life very quickly got in the way, and so for a deeply closeted country boy, it was going to take many different turns at that point, but years later I picked up the, the thread again and finished it, and it became Tank Water, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's um, one of the aims that I had was to recreate life in the country authentically, like Marg was talking about. Um, we do get portrayed very differently to the truth uh, and, and as Mark said, not just in, in literature but also in screen adaptations and screen content. Um, so I don't feel like I'm on a mission to, to correct the, the record but I certainly would love to, to add to the record with, with country writing and uh, there's a lot of us that actually live in the bush so that's, that's my story. Mm, thank you. And Ruth, tell us about you. No, not about your book so much, but about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly enough, um, I am actually living in the country <laughs> at the moment for the first time in my entire life, um, having grown up in suburban Perth and then suburban Long Island in New York, um, as well as Dublin. Uh, so I'm from many places. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Melbourne. Um, I was pretty involved in music there. I studied writing. Um, I spent a long time on my first manuscript, and like you, it was germinating for a long time. Not quite as long, um, but say from when I was about, you know, 23, 24, 
Um, and then I actually started write, uh, writing I Shot the Devil, um, you know, say in 2015. So it was definitely um, a, a very different experience because I was writing again um, based on memory, but I had not been back to America um, since 1994. I left when I was 14 and I felt like there was... Every time I tried to go back, something would get in the way. There was always some kind of barrier or obstacle. And I'd buy a ticket and then it just wouldn't be the right time. And so I started writing in a way to actually reconnect with this sense of home. But that idea that James Baldwin said, you know, home is an irrevocable condition. And it was like, that was my way of kind of working through that process. So uh, in a way, because I felt a little bit like I don't really have a home in a sense, because I've had such a kind of like... Um, geographically sprawling um, kind of life and my family's in Ireland and my friends are in Perth and, um, you know, but my community's in Melbourne. Uh, I guess that's my way of kind of, you know, reconnecting or creating a home within me. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, you've also had a really interesting publishing journey. Let's just talk about all of your publishing journeys. Um, Ruth, you start because yours is a really good story. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I started writing my first book um, when I was 24 and it evolved into a, like, a, a procedural crime novel, which was absolutely horrifying to me because I really didn't feel qualified to do that. So I spent a lot of years researching procedural crime to the point of like just being um you know like a maniac basically like as in I could be a detective <laughs> um <laughs> so I felt that I needed to be that qualified to do it um but it's also a very elaborate form of procrastination just in case you you want to know um so it took me a really long time to write that book and I ended up um entering a competition in Scotland um, called Pitch Perfect and I my book was accepted so I went to Scotland and you know, stood in front of a panel and Denise M Mina or Mina um, and Louise Welsh and all these crime writing heroes of mine, Val McDermott are in the audience and did the pitch and they were like, that's a lot. And, <laughs> and also Perth WA, does anyone really want to read about West Australia? Does anyone want to read West Australian crime novels? Does anyone want to read Australian crime novels? I mean, they're kind of boring. And then this is just pre-Jane Harper. And I was like, I think they do. Like, <laughs> So I predicted rural, rural noir, yeah. by the way. Uh, <laughs> And um, yeah, so I was like tail between my legs, left, you know, the festival and then went to Perth and I started studying with David Wish Wilson and rewriting my first book. And that's when I started writing I Shot the Devil. And I had a couple of setbacks and failures and, you know, false starts with agents and things like that. And then 2018, just started submitting and submitting and submitting. And just on the very precipice, I was going on a trip down to Phillip Island with my partner at the time. And I was like, you know, maybe I need to go to a therapy that will help me process <laughs> failure, like, in this mm. way. And to make me want to not be a writer anymore because it's just not working out. And, like, I'm just, you know, I'm done. And then I just got this email. And then it's just, like, shortly, shortly. And, like, and from that point onwards. And then I won the Rochelle Prize and it was just astonishing to me. And, you know, and, and from that point onwards, you know, everything happened. But it was just... There was so many failures along the way and mm. so much waiting and false starts and, yeah, so... And just at that moment, that very moment when I was ready to quit, that's when I got this kind of, you know, um, green light, which was wonderful. Yeah, amazing journey. Um, Margaret, how did you get to be a published novelist? Well, I was um, working in academia for a, for a long time and I was always writing these short stories and I was really conscious of writing really worthy, really worthy, um, important short stories and they were, they were really horrible <laughs> and, they, um, and, and not a lot of them got picked up. But um, eventually after a long... And then I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop trying to be so worthy and just be really honest and write about, you know, rural lives and rural communities. So I started writing about those things and they, st they started winning some, some significant um, competitions and... Um, and, and and um, being published in literary journals, which you know no one reads, <laughs> but um, but my colleagues read, and they sort of they sort of held in high esteem. But 
you know, <laughs> no one ever reads them really. But, uh, but, but through that, I then got, um, uh, I was um, contacted by Midnight Sun, who, um, who said that they would put together a collection of short stories which became Rural Dreams. And in the meantime, I thought, I'm going to write something w that isn't so hard. For, I'm going to try and write something where I don't think too much about it and just write for enjoyment. So I was at the Grampians with my family and I just started writing something based on I early days of my of the hitchhiking experience that I'd had. And so I started writing about that hitchhiking experience and, um, and I didn't plan it. I, I didn't plan it and eventually um, I wrote, just wrote every day. I didn't tell anyone else I was writing it. And then um, there was the, you know, the, the hot, what do they call it? The date, that dating things. The speed dating. Oh, yeah, yeah. Literary speed dating. And I had literary speed dating. And, and um, Penguin, um, one of Pe Bev Cousins from Penguin was on the speed dating. And, and I pitched her this novel. And she, and she was really wonderful because it was on Zoom. And um, the others were listening to it as well. I was with two others and they kind of listened. But when it came to Bev Cousins, um, she leaned into the into the computer and it was a it was a kindness really and it made me it made me feel more comfort comfortable and free about to talk about this manuscript and anyway she picked it up and I thought this is so easy <laughs> and then and then the structural edits began and then I entered a world of pain <laughs> yeah, that, that's Michael that's uh, that's such a common story <laughs> Um, I was very lucky. Um, I had been writing uh, Tank Water since about 2011. Um, and Richard, my husband, and I moved back to the New England region. He's a country boy too from the Lockyer Valley over the border. And uh, in 2017, we moved back to the country. And so, as I said before, the setting kind of really triggered uh, a big rewriting process. But then, lo and behold, um, our regional writer's centre New England Writers' Centre set up a pitching session very similar to um, the one that Marg was describing. It is like speed dating and I, I asked every writer I knew at that time what they thought of it and they all said, oh, what would you want to do that for? That sounds dreadful and you pay for the displeasure and you, you know, so I had, but I had nothing to lose. I had put my manuscript out to every publisher I could get it to, all of the slush pile uploads. Um, I'd been to a couple of uh, session festival sessions and tried to meet agents and sent it all around. So I really, at that point, had absolutely nothing to lose. And uh, I went along, paid the, I think it was $85, 10 minutes, and um, New England Writers' Centre had imported a couple of editors and publishers from interstate, and one of them was Anna Solding from Midnight Sun. And uh, so I had 10 minutes with Anna and 10 minutes with Ruby from a firm press, and uh, I was so nervous about the process, I researched how to do it before, the best I could. Jane Friedman is a fantastic American writing guru. She's written a couple of articles about this process, and the key that I remember was to just be quiet at some point. <laughs> if you've got four minutes, Jane Friedman says, speak for two. If you've got ten minutes, she says, speak for four, and then shut up. And I thought, that's just going to be me and these people sitting there. <laughs> But of course it's not, because we're all decent human beings. And so then that gives them a chance to ask you questions, which they need to because they're making commercial decisions about the, your intellectual property, yeah. and they need to explore it. And so the 10 minutes, which I thought would feel like 30 seconds, felt like half an hour. And very quietly, both of them said, we'd like to read the manuscript. Do you have it? Now, New England Writers' Centre said, under no account, bring your manuscript with you. <laughs> so I'd been very good and not brought it. But um, Anna leant over to me and she said, you should always break that rule. And uh, so anyway, I sent her the manuscript. It took her about 13 months to make a decision. So I had really written off every opportunity in Australia. I tried, started trying overseas publishers. And uh, I had that kind of discussion about perhaps giving up that you were talking about. Um, Ruth, and I had the discussion with my husband and I was sort of thinking I might actually, for the sake of my mental health, have to actually give this up. A very small part of me was like, no, that's not going to happen, but I was preparing the ground within my marriage to, for that to be okay. And my husband, Richard, was very supportive and he said, look, we will talk about that when we get to that point. So I was very, very grateful and lucky to have that support. And then about a month later... Anna Solding rang me 
and she said two things. She said, she asked, is it still available? And I said, yes, and she said, I'm really sorry it's taken me so long to make a decision about this. I'd really like to publish it. And that was the story of getting it published. So I was like... <laughs> Fantastic. And as a, um, the staying quiet um, is a really good tip for everyone. As a journalist, that's what I often do. I just ask the question and sit in that quietness. And it, and it actually brings out a lot of really good responses and answers that way. Um, but let's talk about their books. Um, all of your novels have something in common, as well as being debut novels, but they're all um, involving um, multiple timelines. Um, Michael, tell us about your main character and also your timeline in, the, in, the, in your story, Tank Water. Well, it, it's probably easier to talk about the timeline first. So there are two main timelines and the protagonist is the same in both. So it takes place in 1985 and in 2005, 20 year gap. And James is the protagonist, James Brandt. He's a journalist, he's an uh, out gay man in the city here, but in the country where he's from, it's the bad old days. And so when he has to return for his cousin's funeral, he realizes very quickly that it's a return to the closet for him because his country family doesn't know really anything about his life in the city not his father. His father's got an inkling. His uncle and aunt really don't have much a, of an idea at all. He's got a great cousin called Yvonne who lives up in Queensland and she's pretty much onto it but they don't really talk about it. And uh, so there's this whole world of pain awaiting him and I, I think it hits him pretty hard the way he's had to transform himself. Um, I very early in the writing process, long before meeting uh, Anna, I wanted to write a book about what goes into closeting. This idea of getting in a piece of furniture and shutting the door is the, the way that popular culture deals with it, but it's actually nothing of the sort. Being closeted is like being hidden in plain sight. It's not about concealing yourself behind the wooden panelling. You actually have to do it like I am talking to you now, you have to put everyone off the scent of the truth and of course you know there's one or two people who are onto you and you have to avoid them for years if you want your secret to be maintained. So this is the germ of James's journey at the start of Tank Water and it's uh, very quickly apparent that it, there's a lot more to what's going on in his hometown of Kippen. It's a fictitious town, it's, but I couldn't help but base it on the towns of the northern New England region, but in my mind's eye, the place is nothing like um, those places. It's an amalgam. I don't want to malign the good people of the New England region, but gay hate crimes do take place in, in the countryside all across the world, and that is one of the major themes of Tank Water. James is a journalist, like I'm a journalist, so the life meets art meets life conundrum that I was in. It's still playing out now. Um, you know, recently I wrote an article about uh, a suspected gay hate crime that took place in Inverell, which is where I was born. And um, it's been a long journey to um, explore very grisly subject matter. And so I get asked a lot, like, when did you know you were writing a crime novel? And I kind of never really did until we put the book together um, at Midnight Sun with a team there. And we kind of had a moment where we could have uh, taken a fork in the road. But I was fairly adamant that it is a crime novel. Gay hate crimes are real. And as we know here in New South Wales, we have a whole new wave of investigation. There's a judicial inquiry has just been announced. But country cases of these kind of crimes are very, very rarely spoken about. They're barely written about. You don't find them in the articles so much. Um, you find them in academic studies. Um, which no one reads, <laughs> and, uh, but they're there, hanging in the air, and there are real people involved in these situations, survivors, of course, and families and friends. So I felt the weight of, um, I felt that weight of that, that history that James, my protagonist, feels, and so it was, in that regard, relatively easy to imbue him with that responsibility to find the truth. And with gay hate crimes, it's a brutal truth. It's absolutely brutal and grisly to read those cases and to hear the submissions to inquiries. 
Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. The protagonist, he has a lot on his shoulders. And um, I mean, I was inspired by a lot of other crime writers who, who um, don't go down the police procedural path. So journalists, we spend a lot of time trying to get information out of courthouse registrars and police rounds. And so we're one step away from the police procedural, and, and that released me from the research that Ruth was talking about. <laughs> um, anyway, that's yeah. a, a long-winded answer to the no, question. No, that's Thank fabulous. You. And I'll just elaborate a little bit on that too. The, the structure of the time mimes is, is absolutely fantastic. Or actually, do you want to? Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, the timeline. So, so swinging between timelines is something that I remember watching in movies and reading in books, and I thought, oh, God, here we go again. We're moving times. There's a lot of time travel writing, there's stuff around at the moment too, and I sort of often feel personally very unsettled by that. I just, I like my story to be linear. So there I was doing exactly what I don't enjoy reading. <laughs> um, so I was really keen to sort of plant seeds in each of the timelines so that they did match to a degree. And it's like uh, I do a lot of um, writing and talking about the narrative arc structure, like the classic roller coaster arc, the narrative plot. And uh, I realised that with two timelines, you've got two of those. You've got two opportunities to do that. So I didn't see it as a restriction, finally. I thought, wow, I understand why other writers do this. Because it gives you far more perspective on the story. And it gives you a chance to bring in characters that are in the past who might not be there in, in the later timeline. People have also asked me, look, in 2005, seriously, were there gay hate crimes happening in 2005? Well, yeah, I'm here to tell you they're still happening in 2021. They were, there was a peak in the cases during the marriage equality public vote that we were all subjected to. And uh, certainly 2005, though, is still very much what I call the bad old days, when in state uh, level we had lots of equalities that weren't actually upheld by authorities. And so 2005 was the perfect time for the second timeline. It was great in 1985 to go to revisit the 80s uh, when we were kids. My sister's here today, Jen. When we were kids, because our family were separated, divorced, we would go back to the country for birthdays and funerals and that sort of thing. So that was James's experience in 1985 because it was mine. So again, it was a, a great resource to put that anxiety of, you know, visiting your country relatives and all of their expectations on everything from the quality of your handwriting to how well you were speaking <laughs> when you were there. So it was a wonderful opportunity, those two timelines for me, which I initially thought would be um, not enjoyable and too much of a challenge. It was a great opportunity. Yeah. And the, and the timelines are based on a really um, great structure where we meet the um, the cousin at his marriage and then we jump forward to the cousin's funeral. So those two really big important um, family occasions. It's just really well done. Margaret, missing teenagers, you know, is that, sounds like it's part of your life, your <laughs> that well, journey. Um, well, uh, yeah, I um, left uh, my place in White Hills when I was about 19 and I said to mum and dad, I'm, I'm out of here and I'm, I'm out of here and, I'm, and I remember saying, and on this day forth I shall never eat another chop and I still have it. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. So I, I didn't eat a chop and I <laughs> left and, um, and dad gave me a bus fare and I um, put it in the back of my jeans pocket and I got on a bus to Adelaide and, um, and then I hitchhiked up the Stuart Highway and got a plane to Timor and um, travelled across the little islands across there and, and then I came back down and, and I did it again and then I hitchhiked up the West Australian coast and I got a job in a place called... They all wanted um, me to be topless barmaid and yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't a fan of that. So then I went up to um, Menzies and I worked in a little place called Menzies and um, I was really badly beaten up in Menzies actually and I had to go back to Perth and... And then I, I didn't tell my parents that, though, till later on. And then I went up to Broome. And yeah, I did lots of different um, things. And it was terrific. It was terrific. And I was often with my older cousin, Josie. And, um, and we took everything in our stride. And we were so adventurous. And I look back now and I think, I really love the person that I was at that time. It was so free. Everything, uh, despite a few... And, and there was a few harrowing experiences, but... 
people were predominantly good. And we would get lifts with our favourite lifts were with um, older women who were probably my age now, yeah. nearly 50, but my age and older, and we'd get them. And our favourite... We hated people in motorhomes or caravans. They never picked us up. To this day, I have an aversion to the camper truck. <laughs> so, but... Um, Older women would pick us up and they, we just loved them because they would sort of, they would tell us off or if I was by myself, they'd sort of tell us off and they'd say, haven't you, what are you doing out here like this? And, oh gosh, what does your mother and father think of this? And, um, and, uh, and then they'd say, put your seatbelt on. <laughs> and, 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 oh. and then they'd say, um, have you got a drink or would you like some, what, there's a banana, have a banana. And then they'd say, you can sleep if you like, you look really tired, so we're probably hung on, so, so we'd sleep. And we, and we really loved them. And often they would say, haven't you heard about what's happening to the girls on the East Coast? Or haven't you heard? And we had, like it was kind of happening and we would, I would see the black and white um, posters on the, on the backpackers' walls and, and sometimes, you know, I'd feel like that, they look like me, you know, they look like me. And, um, and, you know, it was sort of this time and then, of course, Ivan Light like Crimes came out and, and it put that time period to an end. But I don't know so why I'm So tell us about the two timelines, though. So the two yeah. timelines. So in my story, when I started writing this in the Grampians, and it's very much a fiction cutter's end, but um, there are two girls who are hitchhiking up and down the Stuart Highway, that, that wonderful highway. Oh, it's mm. a wonderful... Have you been? Mm. Oh, it cuts the nation in two, and it's, there's something about it. I've been up and down it many times. But um, the timelines, I wanted to put the 80s in, the late 80s and the early 90s, because there was that sense of like freedom mm. and going to pubs and, you know, drinking cask wine in parks and <laughs> smoking and not worrying about sunscreen or... <laughs> and, I, and I sort of thought everyone was good and I was, I, I, we trusted it. It was a really lovely time. So, mm. And it was fun, talking about scrunchies and... Uh, so that, I, I, I loved writing that part. But then, of course, the crime occurs then and then the investigation takes part in present day. And, and, and that held its own challenges, um, as Michael said, with the, two, with the two time frames. But it was fun too to, to kind of connect them and tie them in towards the end. Um, and that's where my editors were so amazing because they said, no, you know, this didn't happen in 1989 or that wasn't invented in 1999. They were brilliant. But um, I managed to tie those two things in together. And, uh, yeah, it was interesting. I wanted to have a current person looking at a crime in 1989 and early 90s, particularly for how um, women were treated in the yeah. justice system then because, you know, even, you, you know, things... I wouldn't have reported some of the stuff that happened to yeah. us and then. No, I wouldn't have thought about it, but yeah. today I would. Um, and so I wanted to kind of bring that to light as well. Yeah, mm. it's fascinating the, tr the treatment between the two very relatively short time periods, mm. but the treatment of, of women and, and how the police conduct themselves. Mm. Ruth, reliving a story through teenage and adult eyes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I actually was just thinking what you were saying. It's actually so much more challenging to write about the recent past, I find, and to make sure, because, you know, you're sort of like, when did smartphones come out? Like, when did, you know, <laughs> was that AOL chat rooms? Like, you know, it's just sort of like, you know, what was your experience of the internet, for example? You know, so for me, writing about... Um, I mean, I have a really clear recollection of 1994. I was 14, um, and that was the year that I left America. And for me, that was really important for me to recreate that time. Um, also, from a, on a personal level, but also because of the political kind of themes of my book, which is, you know, it's a, a very much like Me Too crime fiction. Um, so discussing things that that was it was important because I wanted it to take place just sort of around the satanic panic, so just sort of uh, to make sure that it included that, but so that it felt real and authentic to me and it, it reflected my experience. I also added, because, so I was 14 at that time, I was living in America, but my brother was four years older than me um, and I very much vicariously lived through him. You know, he was having a great time in New York, he was going to clubs, he was going and going to parties and festivals and I was kind of like, just this sort of like sort of preteeny nerdy kind of like can I hang out with you you and your friends and just starting to go to the city by myself um, so 
I very much kind of was informed by his taste in music and his books and his friends and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, so then I relocated um, the crimes uh, which were basically very loosely based on a true crime um, to 1994 for that reason. And then I worked in... I, I tend to like to work in, say, a few years um, before the year that I'm writing the book in. So at the moment, say, like, I always set the book, say, maybe, like, now it's 2021, I'll set it in 2018. Partly also because I never want to write about COVID. <laughs> but it feels just like, it just feels comfortable. So when I started writing the book, it was 2015. So 2010 seemed to be significant. Um, and also for me, it had, uh, numbers are really important. I have a kind of sort of OCD about it in, in a way. Um, I like things to match up in terms of anniversaries and and, and things that were special to me. And for, for me also it was 16 years, so it had to kind of like coincide like that. But yeah, there is such a challenge with writing multiple timelines and with editors, that's where you're just blessed, you know. <laughs> um, and even though editing, you know, can be really, really hard, it's just also like someone's coming in, they're an angel sent from heaven to to pick up stuff for you that you've you've messed up because there can't be inconsistencies with stuff like that so yeah writing um multiple timelines and then i obviously have a another narrative so i have um you know multiple kind of contesting narratives um within my book because i like to drive myself insane yeah. so <laughs> to have them all tee up and then if you can pull that off it's you know it's wonderful um but you know you pull it off with a lot of assistance so yeah, terrific. Let's talk about settings. Um, in, in a way, all your settings are, are different but similar. Uh, Ruth, let's start with you again because you've got a really unusual setting. Yeah, so my town um, that I set the book in um, is actually a fictionalised version of the town that I grew up in. <laughs> uh, and it is very much a replica. Um, I hadn't actually been back um, until I went back in two thousand and. 19. Yeah, so it had been since 1994. And it was Just say where that is. Oh, yeah, so it's Merrick, New York, um, Long Island. Um, when I was growing up, um, Amy Fisher, the, I don't know if anyone knows about the Amy Fisher case, it was huge in the States. Um, there were like three TV movies made about it. Alyssa Milano, Drew Barrymore. Yeah, play, yeah. Uh, uh, they played Amy Fisher and it was about this um, lethal Lolita schoolgirl who shot her um, married partner's... Um, a uh, married boyfriend's uh, wife and she was very badly injured and then it just became this absolutely horrific sensational case. Um, but, you know, obviously all these true crimes occurred and the, the crime that I'd actually written about um, had occurred in Suffolk County, so it wasn't Nassau County where I was from, but I relocated it to this fictional town um, and I'd not heard of this crime. This was a satanic crime, alleged satanic crime. Um, that happened in 1984 and so, yeah, so I obviously relocated it in time and in um, it, geographically to this fictional version of the town that I grew up in. Um, I set it sort of in the city too, in little little parts, but generally I was comfortable writing about Southport because that was what I remembered. Um, so, and also Florida, um, the book also takes place in Florida because uh, we went down to Florida a lot when I was a, a kid. Um, my stepfather's parents lived there. We did a lot of road trips and I just remember it being, you know, on that kind of precipice of, of turning into a teenager. And my brother and I were always really, really close and we went to go see the Nightmare on Elm Street movie and had like the 3D glasses when we were there. And um, I shoplifted throughout the whole trip and like... <laughs> <laughs> I come back my mom was like where did you get that and I was like I, I, I someone gave it to me <laughs> um <laughs> yeah and just the, this kind of um I, I, I don't know it's really I just love the kind of like tropical um but also that sort of theme park nature of it and that's why I love the Gold Coast too um <laughs> and um yeah so those two settings were all just um recreated entirely from memory and then when mm. I went back I sort of incorporated some of the elements of my narrator's um, return to Southport. It was like my return to Merrick. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I recreated the strangeness of that because it was so, so different when I went back. Like the dimensions felt different. I walked past my own house. I didn't recognise it. It hadn't mm. really changed. It was just like 
my memory had just completely distorted it. So, mm. yeah, it was pretty wild. I love how you describe that in the novel, how the character returns and everything is different, the same but different. It's um, really interesting. Margaret, you've described the highway really well, but tell us about the rest of the setting. So, so yes, the, the setting is... Uh, one part of the setting is the Stuart Highway, up and down that highway, and... Um, and I, lo I, I do love that area for so many reasons in the Australian outback. For those of, those of you who have been there, there's a feeling there, isn't there, that um, there's an unsettling feeling there and that's got a lot to do with um, white belonging and that's kind of my, my PhD stuff is, you know, mm -hmm. the notion of belonging or not belonging and, and coming to terms with it. So I find that really interesting. It's also a place where literally no one can hear you scream so it's perfect for a crime novel. <laughs> But um, it's, it has an immense beauty too, um, the, an, an immense beauty with the low trees and the acacia and the spinifex and um, the, 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 da the pincushion daisies that come out after a flood, all that kind of thing. So I wanted to put all of that in there. But um, it's also set in the um, Murray town of uh, South Australia as well. So mm. up north of, on the way to the Barrier Highway. And, um, and, and I had my police, my policeman, a Victorian policeman, and I was, and in, and, um, I was having him cross jurisdictions and they said, no, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. You're gonna have to make him a South Australian cop. So I had to move him to Adelaide and have his hometown in that that sort of caused me a bit of grief. But I, lo <laughs> I, I love Adelaide, I just don't know it as, as well. Um, so I had to do a lot of research there. But yes, my settings are Adelaide, the Stuart Highway, and up around the, the um, Barrier Highway as well, mm. yes. And Michael? Setting uh, is such an interesting subject because I think when they say, they being the big establishment, they say, write what you know, I think setting is the is the shorthand way into doing that because these are landscapes that we obviously all really know very very well and so you kind of don't have to stretch the truth so far you you've got a way to write about it and the setting of tank water is the northern new england region it's camilleroy country the gomeroy people um it's a region which i've known since i was born and there are parts of it that you know, I will always just love, no matter what took place there. It's a, it's a imposed landscape. It's a rural landscape on a much, much older landscape that, uh, you know, has been settled, not seeded, of course. Um, and, yeah, I, uh, people, ask, people have said to me or asked me about why I didn't spend time writing about its beauty, because I do feel it's beautiful, but I didn't necessarily want to indulge in that. Um, it, I think it would have been a bit of a cheap shot in a sense because James and the other characters are not necessarily feeling <laughs> beautiful thoughts at the time that they're going on this crime journey. So, but nevertheless, I did imbue it. I consciously imbued it with just a few glimpses of that. But when James is asked to describe it by his partner, he tries and then says, no, you'll have to see it for yourself. And that was a conscious decision of mine to not really get into the, the nitty gritty. I think a lot of outback noir were encouraged to really, you know, go on that journey of describing the grass and the flowers and the, but it's, it's, it's not always relevant. I didn't feel it was relevant to the story and being a journalist, of course, um, I don't know what, cause you're a journalist too. And I think Marg, you've written some journalism, have you? Uh, no, have you ever written any journalism? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know how, we don't get a lot of words to describe, so you think adjectives, you've got to leave them all out because it's going to spoil your, your word count. So I felt that writing fiction, but I have to say, in terms of setting, I writing about setting, I think I've become a better journalist in that regard, having written long-form fiction now. It's made me more able to actually, in a paragraph, put a place on its feet, just with word, good word choices and um, not really going into kind of... I don't, I don't want to say that I'm negatively judging writers that do go down that pathway because there are some incredible Australian writers who write setting absolutely beautifully. It's just that for me, for this sort of journalistic style that I have, it's, it's not necessary and it's, I think it kind of it goes against the idea of the story that I want to impart. Depends on the character too. Mm. Um, 
The setting though, the, ma the primary setting of tank water is three farms down the one laneway. Um, when I say that, you know, in my mind's eye that this, the, the towns, the fictitious towns in tank water are not based on the truth, that laneway and those three farms is really to the blade of grass. <laughs> a recreation of those. And in actual fact, I, um, one of the homes in it, I had to say to the, the family friend of ours who, who grew up in that other house, I had to warn them and say, look, your house is in this story, but none of the characters are based in any way on your family because it was a, a, the quintessential homestead, working farm home with the home yard that I knew as a child. It wasn't our home. Our home was a bit more rough and tumble than that. And, uh, our f but our family friends was a state-of-the-art, well-run, grazing holding. And the house is the house. It's called Deloraine in tank water. The house is, is a real place. And um, I sort of tried to mask it a bit and thought, I'll stuff it. I know it so well. It's got to be that place. <laughs> so that, that's my approach to setting. It's a bit like, you know, Frankenstein's monster. You add bits here, you change bits there. The cover of the book was created by Kim Locke, who's a great cover designer and author. And when uh, the first time I saw the one that I really liked, it had this railway causeway at the bottom of the cover and I didn't have a railway causeway in it, but I had an opportunity to write one in because I didn't want them to use a different image. Mm. And there's so many of those beautiful, decrepit railway causeways around the northern New England region. I thought, that's indelibly the setting. So that came from the cover design, not from... It was e relatively easy to do because there was a bridge in the story. So setting, yeah, it's, I think it, go, it can go right through to the cover. It can go, mm. um, you know, people... I've, I've met people who've slightly misconstrued where the story is set as well because the New England is a really big place and they're like thinking I'm riding around Tamworth region which is a long way from where I live. So, you know, people have their own, readers have their own idea about where you're writing about. We've got no control over that, let's face it. So. That's right. Thank you. Um, on the subject of adjectives, my first ever editor said to me that nine words per sentence was my maximum. <laughs> <laughs> so that was drilled into me right from the beginning. Um, just um, before we go to audience questions, I'd like to ask you, what do you think your measure of being a successful writer will be? H how will you measure that for yourself? Michael, you go first. I, I love the fact that people are able to define our own success. I think that's a really wonderful question because so many people will try to define it for us as writers. Yeah. And so I think I've lived long enough to sort of and been a bit resilient, had to be a bit resilient enough to learn that lesson already. But for me, success is about uh, people getting to the last page of the book and letting you know because it's so easy to read a book and just move on to the next one. So I, I feel success uh, from people who actually contact me or come up to me and tell me how much they've gotten out of the book. Um, it, it, a lot of people will start reading Tank Water and I kind of know when they haven't read it because they believe that the story is about suicide. It starts with a suspected suicide, but we, we learn a lot more from that. So I do know when people actually haven't read <laughs> the whole thing, which is kind of interesting. But success for me is to, is, as a writer in general, not just of, of novels, but is, is readability. So when people actually come up to you, write to you, and actually want to really discuss the themes or the, the, the conundrum, the supposition that you're written about, whether it's a, an article or a novel, because somehow you've opened a door for them and um, I think readers are half the job of a writer. A, a good writer can actually leave a lot for the reader's imagination and their experience. And so I love those conversations. That's my measure of success is to, to have them and I love it. Mm. And Ruth, how will you measure success? Well, I'd be lying if I didn't say, you know, we, we want that kind of external affirmation of, you know... Um, people celebrating it in reviews or, you know, um, sales and, and whatnot. Um, so, you know, obviously we all want that. Uh, I guess for me, despite, you know, now being published, I, kn I know that I'd always be writing irrespective, um, even if my book wasn't published, even if it failed. Um, so for me, feeling like I'd written something the best that I could, and I guess like I think Zadie Smith said, you know, failing better <laughs> each time 
you know, knowing that I had, um, you know, written a greater book or a book that I was really proud of, um, that would be my measure of success. But when people have reached out and read it, um, especially people who don't like reading, um, who like, who've been like, I sat and read it and I read it in two days, like, and you know, I mean, uh, that that to me is is you know pretty astounding, um, and that feels pretty wonderful, um, and that feels like a, a measure of success. But actually, it's believability. Um, I had a friend say to me, oh, you know, I was walking around the other day and I thought I saw Ricky Hell, and then I remembered he's not real, and I was like, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So it's it's that having you know gotten away with it <laughs> you know it's like you believed it you fell for it that 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 to me is is you know a real measure of success so margaret yeah uh, i was um walking down the street once in um, my country town and this person came up to me and said is it true are you really margaret hickey and i went <laughs> i said yes and they said I have loved your books for so long. Your recipe on Irish peat um, <laughs> cupcakes gets me, and, I, and that's a different Margaret Hickey. There's a really famous author <laughs> called Margaret Hickey who writes, I know, who writes Irish um, <laughs> recipe books and she's really well known, but I was... <gasps> <gasps> so for a moment, for a moment I felt it. Um, but I, I don't know, I don't feel... I, st I work full time as an English teacher. Um, I, I don't feel partic particularly feel successful. I felt good when um, when I've been commissioned, when I've been contracted, or whatever you say, to write a, two further books. I mm. thought, surely now that can make me feel. Surely now that means something. But um, I, I'm still waiting for the for Margaret Hickey to die and me to <laughs> carry the child. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Let's get to some audience questions. Who would like to ask a question, please? I'll just repeat those questions so the people at um, home watching on Zoom can hear. Um, the first question is to Margaret about what do people get wrong about writing rural Australia? And a follow-up question to Michael um, about... Uh, we'll get to that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, no, of course not everyone gets it wrong and I, I, it's not like every day this is my, you know, the hill, ship I'll, hill I'll die on, is yeah. that the saying? Yeah. Is that the saying? <laughs> Something yeah. like that. So it's not like that. But um, I do feel frustrated sometimes when I see movies or, or read books where the country characters are foolish, um, where they're uneducated, uh, where they're kind of a bit of a fodder for jokes. Um, I've lived in I've lived in really small country towns and slightly bigger country towns my whole life and country towns are a microcosm of cities. There's good people, there's bad people, there's idiots, there's funny people, there's boring people, um, there's doctors, there's lawyers. You know, there's there's people with lots of people with PhDs who you may not think have PhDs, and I do I, I do feel that and on, in television too it it really irks me. It also irks me when weather reporters um, in Melbourne and Sydney say, good news, we've got um, great weather, the sun's coming out the next few days. And I think, what, my t I've had to buy water for the last three weeks. Mm. Don't tell me it's good. Like that. So it's like a, um, not being acknowledged, perhaps. Um, you know, we're at the coal face, as it were, of climate change. So there's, yeah. you know, people, country people are really aware of these things. And sometimes they're not made out to be so, I think. Mm -hmm. But not always, of course, but just sometimes. Can you just repeat your question for Michael? And for people at home, it's um, being, if you're a young person in rural Australia today, is it easier or, or harder being gay? Thank you for calling me young. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's very kind. Um, look, there's no mistaking the fact that Richard and I moved back uh, during, at the very tail end of the marriage equality survey. So the results were announced about two weeks after we arrived back and um, we looked at two results, two seats the seat of Bowman in southeast Queensland where we'd campaigned very strongly 
uh, held by Andrew Lamming, who'd always claimed it was 60% against marriage equality, when in actual fact it was 63% in favour of marriage equality. Yeah. So, big lie going on there. New England, uh, under Barnaby Joyce, it was a 53 point something percent yes vote, which was fantastic. Um, you know, with a bit of different yeah. leadership, it probably would have been a lot higher. Um, so that was marvellous to move back to. And then in the four years since then, we have just, by being out and visible in the country, we have made a difference. It, you can see it just, one of the most profound examples was just doing something as innocuous as an afternoon tea at, at a friend's house in our town of deep water. And you can just see the, A, acceptance for you and your partner, but also the wider group of people, including really critically their children and grandchildren. Yeah. And after years of campaigning for equality, and the equality campaign will continue, not just for marriage, of course we've got the religious discrimination bill in front of parliament, um, it's so gratifying to see that we're getting to the point where you don't have to actually march or door knock or petition for certain things to make a very big difference. You c I think in, in the country most definitely, to answer your question specifically, just being visible makes a huge, huge difference. And it's not to say that there aren't prejudices and that there isn't homophobia or transphobia in the country, but like Marg says, the country is really a microcosm of the city, so we don't see particularly different phenomenon going on there. There were some fantastic yes results in regional Queensland, for example. This was the zone that everyone was really worried about. And whether we got a higher result there because we were more worried and we campaigned more heavily there, we probably will never know. But certainly if you'd asked me as 15 year old in 1985 what I would envisage for myself living in the country, I would have said, well, A, I'm never gonna live in the country ever again. <laughs> um, because my fear about being out it was never ge geographically specific, but I would have thought, oh no, the judgment will be greater. But I actually think, I've come to learn that country people have a great ability to dig really deep when it comes to loving their, their own, our own. And there are some ways where I think they perhaps dig a bit deeper when it comes to gay and lesbian and transgender, etc., members of their families. They might not necessarily be having a great time or want to wave rainbow flags, etc. Not that there's anything wrong with doing that. But they will actually stick by their kids now. And uh, I, actually, I was talking to a politician about this recently and it was his belief, he's an out gay politician, Shane Mallard in New South Wales. He believes, and I totally agree with him, that now you're safer if you're out in the country. People look out for you. People will keep an eye on you like they keep an eye on all the kids in the community. Whereas in the bad old days, you were safer in the closet. So that's probably the simplest way to answer your question. It's very early days, but the signs are really, really hopeful. Mm, that's great. Um, next question. The question from Petronella McGovern, another crime writer, is um, have you started writing your next book? The first draft of my next one is due, um, Penguin wants it, on December the 23rd. <laughs> <laughs> a a and so I'm seven, I've been writing crazily, just ignoring my family, not doing anything, my, you, know, um, you know, being terrible teacher, all that sort of thing. But I still don't know who did it. So, I'm <laughs> so, a, a, and then, and then the third one is due December the twenty third next year. So, um, if you've got any ideas, let you know. <laughs> Ruth, uh, yes, I have. Um, <laughs> I obviously my uh, my debut is not my first book, so I have another book. Um, but I have written another novel, um, and I've written a novella. And I'm reading, writing, I'm about 20,000 words into another book, which is absolutely kicking my ass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't have a deadline for that, except for a self-imposed one. <laughs> I've got a log jam. <laughs> and I, I had a log jam for a few years. Tank Water was the first one. You know, there was a TV show, I don't know what it was called in the 70s, of 
you know, the log the loggers that would dance on top of the mm. the logs turning on the river. Mm. And they and they they'd kick one out. So I've kicked tank water out. It's gone down the river. But there's there's others in there's yeah, I'm still dancing on others. I have I'm up to a, about five or six full length manuscripts and so I've got a lot going on in here and in here. But I, I love it. I've fallen in love with the process. I used to fear writing long form fiction. I wrote myself off for ever being able to do it, even like a first draft. Yeah. To actually complete it, to get, you know, what, 70 or 80,000 words or more down on the page. Now I don't have that problem. So it's, it's, but it's formed another frontier, if you like, of actually getting them out. Um, so I've got a lot of first drafts. I leave them for a while. I used to leave them for about a year, but I've got a couple that are now, I've left them for two years because I've been busy with other stuff. I've written um, in different genres. Historical fiction is probably the one that's the most polished, almost ready to go. Um, but also, I, with Tank Water, I, I found a way, t I really loved, I really love the way that just about all the main characters in Tank Water have committed some kind of crime, <laughs> whether it be a victimless crime or shoplifting or, um, you know, of course, there are much more serious crimes in it. But I, I realised during that, I thought, wow, I actually kind of like that area of crime quite a lot. Because uh, with victimless crimes um, or petty crimes, uh, in Australia we have this history where you don't have to go too far back in the future and they were considered heinous crimes. You could get your hands cut off if you were caught stealing in 1838, I read a couple of years ago. Your hands lopped off in public as, as a form of punishment. So now, in the more modern world, I, I really do like those, I don't know what the word for them is, they're very subtle crimes. I've written something which I don't really know what the genre of it is. It's very much to do with real estate. It's set now, I'm, having, I'm gonna have to set it before COVID because I, 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 just, I, can't, I can't imbue it with COVID, I really can't, it'll probably change too much. But there's probably the one which is the most like a crime thriller mystery saga, that particular manuscript, but I haven't touched it for it for a year now. So I'm looking forward to getting back into that. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thanks everyone. We're we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, you're welcome to join us for a chat and everyone's going to be signing books um, opposite the library cafe after um, the session now. And can everyone please re, uh, leave the room, even if you're staying for the next session, uh, because they need to clean it in between um, everybody. But j please join me uh, with a big, rowdy, loud thank you to our guests. <laughs>